Well, good morning, everybody. Here's my plan for today. I'm going to start off by talking a bit about the longer term statistics in Mexico, just to kind of get another idea about the extensiveness of the drought there. We're then going to walk through where this pattern recently was with respect to the ridge that was in the west and what that's done in terms of kind of just a near term, a short term redistribution of our temperature pattern and what we think that might be doing in the future. We're then going to walk through the two week forecast, several slides on just where the precipitation will be and where it won't be and how the temperatures are transitioning as we're working our way toward the solstice. And at the very end here, I've got new long range information from the National Multimodel Ensemble. We'll do a multimodel comparison and I'll finish this up at the very end with a bit on La Nina and also a global update. So we'll, we'll get all that done here in the next few minutes. So let's start back in Mexico. Uh, yesterday, as you watch the deeper convection blow up in the mountains, it's important to note that while this is producing localized very heavy rainfall, our extensive drought in Mexico is still a major issue. And as we just see the smoke from the wildfires for weeks, uh, living in the Bay of Campeche, moving into this part of, of the Pacific and, and also advecting at times into the southern part of the United States, it's a reminder of just how dry it's been. So I want to show you this. This is looking at the ERA-5 data set. It's a global reanalysis data set. And where we are is looking at a time series from 1940 uh, to uh, 2024 for the month of May. And we're looking over the entirety of Mexico. And right now, May 2024 ranks, I think, third driest, with the second driest being here in 1961 and the driest being in 1998. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, that year particularly has my attention, not because it's a strong analog to this year, but that was a year where late in the year, when the hurricane season was going, we had a devastating hurricane named Mitch that hit Central America, um, killing tens of thousands with flooding rains. And you're going to see in the longer range forecast, which I'll give you in a few minutes, uh, that, that the moisture is expected to really increase throughout the Caribbean, throughout the Gulf of Mexico, and into Mexico as we go toward the middle of this summer. And that's going to be an important shift overall in our uh, precipitation patterns late this year, or late this summer, I should say. Speaking of shifts, this is what the last seven days look like in terms of average temperature anomalies. Uh, for the first time in a while, we saw a ridge build into the western United States. It was part of that positive PNA pattern. But with the cooler air that was sitting here across this part of Canada, we did get stronger flow at times, kind of coming out of the north and west, curling up into lows that lived over the Great Lakes. It was actually those lows that left lingering frontal boundaries that allowed for a lot of storms to blow up in parts of the high plains while there was still rain moving to these but the bigger storms were here in the central and western and high plains of the united states well i bring that up because while that ridge did set i mean it was hot we, we saw a lot of locations when you go from the 4th of june to the 9th of june having when you compare that week to um all of you know the historical data going back 132 years i mean that was one of the hottest you know early june weeks we've had on record in this area but while that drove cooler air at times through here, this whole pattern is really just temporary and it's already beginning to break down. And we're going to watch how it continues to break down as we go forward. What I was really interested in was this. This is what last week looked like. All right. We brought a deep trough into this area that for months had ridging. And that was our big story. Like how long was this going to last? And how long was this larger ridge that was in the West going to last? because um, its duration was going to be critical to the summer setup. Uh, what's also interesting about this, because of course it didn't last, is what it did to ocean temperatures. Now let me take you back before all this started. This was back on June the 1st. At that point, where all that high pressure had sat and the jet stream stayed way to the north, you remember we've drawn this many times, giving us this flow really since April. We saw this water getting very warm. In fact, right in through here, uh, averaging temperatures between 4 and 8 degrees Celsius above normal. Well, what happened is a trough temporarily dipped into this area, bringing in cloud cover, changing the wind direction and speed, you know, basically uh, stopping the sun, which had just, you know, complete access to the ocean surface with no clouds under high pressure. Well, we brought in clouds and we changed the pressure. And just take a look at this. This is what the ocean temperatures look like on the 8th. So there's the 1st to the 8th. We push some of that warmer water to the coast. Now, this is a temporary thing. If we bring back more ridging into this area, you'll watch those temperatures come right back up. But overall, that's a pretty interesting kind of shift around in the ocean temperatures. Did you also notice this? 
you know, what appears to be our kind of burgeoning La Nina here. Over the last week, well, we've kind of seen these eddies that kind of show up as the cooler water services kind of wash out of it. And this has been an area that, um, you know, we, we're waiting on La Nina to form, but we still think it's going to be a, a fall event or a winter event, not necessarily one that's going to show up this summer as a dominant driver. So just take a look at that. I find this uh, fascinating to watch these ocean temperature patterns shift around a bit. Okay, thinking through all of that, here's where we are today. Uh, this trough is progressing east. And so where it sat deeply here for the last several days, pushing a ridge into the west and up, it's broken down. And now that ridge across the west is done. It's actually moved here into the central part of the United States, but it's not even going to live there for very long either. This pattern is, is open and it's moving. And as a result of that, we're going to have to pay attention to where these temperatures are going to shift the most and where we're expecting the heavier rainfall. So we'll get to that in a second. But I did want to bring this up. If you notice in the previous animation, see how the flow's coming out of uh, the north here deep? I mean, this is way up in the atmosphere. This is jet stream level winds. Well, at the surface, the winds calmed down last night. And the National Weather Service yesterday afternoon released a couple of areas here uh, under the, or uh, not released, but uh, issued for a couple of areas here, uh, frost advisories. And uh, I was looking at the temperatures early this morning, and there were a couple of spots. Um, I did find one there. That location did dip down to 32. The weather station picked up a frost this morning, but there's a lot of mid 30s in this area, meaning patchy frost under clear skies and calm winds. Notice you don't see any wind barbs on these uh, weather station um, uh, plots. From there, I'm going to go back to the all hazards map to show you we still have excessive heat watches uh, and warnings throughout the west. And we still have some of the heat that's packed in. And there's flood issues going on right in through here, including some dense fog in parts of Tennessee and Kentucky. If we take a look at the satellite data, there's that stalled out front I talked about all week last week. So the low curled up here early this morning, you can see that front. And this was part of the front that initiated several of the, the very large storm uh, complexes that were in the midsection of the country, but also it was a bit of an outperformer in this area, if you ask me. On Friday, we were not anticipating much rain out of this, but as it did come through parts of uh, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, a bit in North Carolina, it did produce um, some locally uh, more heavy rain. But just take a look at yesterday. There's that frontal boundary. Watch the deep convection blow up as the sun sets. Now, you can even see the ridge. See how it's kind of flowing around like this? There's that ridge that we dealt with last week and through this weekend. And some of these storms, again, were just big hailers, strong straight line winds. And if we just look back over the weekend, here's our storm reports from the 9th, okay, 78 of them. Go back to the 8th, and we can see that corridor coming out of Colorado into parts of Kansas and over into Missouri. Several reports of straight line wind damage. We had some very nasty storms uh, that formed here over the weekend, uh, producing these reports. If you go back to the 7th, again, it was a lot of Nebraska. There was a slow-moving frontal boundary, produced some of the most photogenic storms I've ever seen. If you just go look at my Twitter feed, I, all the things I liked over the weekend, you'll see them. Uh, but some of these storms put down some very, very uh, heavy rainfall in this area. And with that rain also came some big hail. Our weekend hail reports are shown here based off radar data. And just notice how few of these storms were putting down, you know, uh, golf ball to baseball size hail rolling through that same stormy corridor we just identified a moment ago. I was thinking through all that and just wanted to go back and bring up the preliminary storm reports as to where we are so far this year. Um, well over 1,100 tornadoes, over 7,000 reports of severe weather, and over 3,600 reports of large hail. And just because we did this last week, I want to show it to you again. Where we currently stand uh, compared to our historical averages, just take a look at the difference here between 2024 and average on tornado reports. Hail is just a, a bit above average here, but remember, we still have the second half of the hail season to go as these storms tend to be moving a bit more farther to the north as the jet stream retreats. And in terms of winds, winds were not even yet to the peak of the season and we're already, you know, well above the historical averages. It's usually in June, July, and August that we get most of our straight line wind damage reports and we've been well, well ahead of average here. And since I showed you the seasonal stuff with those two, let's go back to tornadoes just to let you know that we're now, as we move into June and July, on the back side of our busiest time of year for tornadoes, especially in the central part of the United States. But just wanted to keep you posted on those things. Okay, last 72 hours of total accumulated precipitation. 
And what's important about this is some of the rain that made it back into the panhandle of Texas and Oklahoma, uh, also through Kansas and Missouri right in through here. Remember how we've been watching how um, you know dry parts of Kansas has been. And also the storms in southern Florida, one of our driest areas in the country over the last couple of months. Okay, I wanted to just slow down a moment here and just talk about where the recent precipitation patterns have kind of driven the anomalies. Because I found this interesting this morning when I made this map. Now, if you take note, let's just kind of go west to east. The Columbia Basin, getting down into central Oregon, the eastern half of the Snake River Valley, most of Montana. These areas lately, as that ridge built in, uh, got very, very dry. And before that, the flow was just coming in straight from the west, which is what made the mountains so wet. So notice it's wet here and here, but the rain shadow is so exaggerated. I bring this up because Montana, about a month ago, was quite wet. So we've transitioned over to much a much drier pattern. Then take a look here in parts of uh, South Dakota, stretching into northern Nebraska, and then a large section of Iowa and western northwestern Illinois. This has been an area that lately has missed out on some of the heavy rains that many of the surrounding areas have certainly had. Further to the south, while we've seen better precipitation getting farther back to the west, this is critical for cotton acres as an example. Just take note that we have areas that are still, just in the last couple of weeks, right in through here, between 300 and 600 percent of normal on precipitation. And the southeast is going to have to become something we're really going to focus on here in this 14-day forecast that I'm about to give you. Because we've had drier conditions, despite the rain that just came through here this morning, we were still quite dry coming out of Florida into Georgia, parts of South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia. And I bring this up because there is uh, kind of something taking shape in the forecast models that they trended all weekend toward that uh, we haven't seen in a while. So we need to get to that in a few moments here. But first, I just want to give you the latest soil moisture map. I just like to keep these in the back of your mind as we go forward, um, just to kind of compare that to the recent precipitation. But we've got a lot of saturated ground out there because of how active and wet this spring has been. So here you go. Over the next couple of weeks, this is the European models forecast from June 10th to June 24th, looking at average precipitation anomalies. Now remember, what we do with this map is we, we, just, we just look at it for pattern. We're not looking at it for magnitude and we're just looking at it for pattern. And I see a couple of important things. There's a northerly shift in the storm track. There's the risk of a broader area that's gonna likely stay on the drier side of average. Not dry, but on the drier side of average. And something's going on in the tropics. We spent a lot of time talking about this last week, but there is some moisture being evicted out of the tropics that's gonna be rolling through Southern Florida, hitting some of the driest area in the country compared to average and uh, delivering quite a bit of precipitation. Now, of course, when I say that, I understand that we have a desert. I'm just talking about compared to their historical averages, how dry it's been. So let's get in here and kind of deal with this. Upper level height pattern. I'm gonna go right to the European artificial intelligence. I've really enjoyed using this to help pick out some of these bigger features. As we play through Monday into Tuesday and Wednesday, can you see what the troughs are rolling through? They're kind of staying across the northern tier of the United States. And while we still have ridging and higher heights in the west and southwest, we've broken down the big positive PNA pattern. And that was done by the troughs moving toward British Columbia. Once we get toward this weekend, we have to pay very close attention to those short waves like this one sneaking through the flow. And I'll give you the update on the severe weather in a few moments. But what's caught my attention is out here. Sunday the 16th, 17th, 18th. This is into next week, Tuesday. We finally see, uh, see in the forecast a southeast ridge. Now, I've talked extensively about how we haven't had a Bermuda high. It's been split. Part of it went for the last couple of months way up here to like Greenland and the Canadian archipelago. Another big chunk of it went up into Scandinavia. But we've seen more often than not that the Mexico ridge has wanted to move into Texas and New Mexico. But to see a ridge of high pressure forming in this area, we have to start to ask, is this going to be something that becomes a bit more frequent in the flow? And is this maybe where another piece of the Bermuda High is trying to, to, to form? Or, or is it just temporary? But I'll say this, as we get out there, if we go back to this, this is going to light up the central part of the United States with more risk of strong to severe storms, which is not captured in a map like this, just so you know. But as we go out there past that point getting all the way out there to 10 days from now 
June 20th. This is right at about the solstice. Larger ridge sitting here, trough in the west. And that ridge is going to have to be paid close attention to. How does it redistribute heat across the lower 48, especially east of the Rocky Mountains? And does it last all the way out there to like, you know, the full beginning of summer? All I have to say is once we get out there, I mean, I know we're way out in the forecast. This is a much further north position of the jet stream than it's been in a while. And I think that's going to start to really change things up across the U.S. So let's get in and talk about it. Here is the low level wind flow today. Now, what I'm going to point out is there's some of our drier, cooler air. But take a look at the flow coming off of the open Atlantic through the Caribbean and making this hard turn, meeting up with this flow here, setting up what could be very wet conditions over part of Florida. And then we already see the rebound of the flow coming up to this weaker low that's in southern parts of Saskatchewan, which I'll be in later on tonight. And uh, I've got this flow coming up here. It's going to set up some storms in this area. So if we look at the day one forecast for severe convection, we've got it down here in Georgia and South Carolina. And then we're going to watch the whole of the plains, north to south, with the greatest concentration coming out of Wyoming, western Nebraska, North Dakota, uh, South Dakota, forgive me. Getting into tomorrow, we'll have to see how the Storm Prediction Center lets this evolve. I wouldn't be surprised if they go over toward a slight risk in a couple of different areas. But then as we get out here into the 12th, it's going to be stretching across this part of the Western Corn Belt and Upper Midwest that we got our greater, greatest risk of storms. Early this morning, I was watching some nasty storms rolling through Texas, and I think the model was pretty well initialized. As we play this forward, there goes our low. And by tonight, look at the storms kind of blowing up right here where we've got that uh, slight risk for severe storms. Meanwhile, precipitation tries to exit east. There's some scattered storms, and again, watch right in the, through there tonight for the risk of some strong to severe weather. We then play through the day tomorrow and see the front passing through Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin. Isolated storms, this is why I think they might blow this up to a, a slight risk tomorrow uh, that are going to be coming out of central Texas. Again, we've seen these storms time and time again outdo their forecasts. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we work our way toward midweek. This would be out there through about 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday. At that point, we really see the moisture being invected out of the Gulf of Mexico hitting that area. And I want to show you what it looks like. This is a fascinating animation. So when you look at this, these colors are where we have drier air, and these are where we have much, much wetter air, more moisture. So as I play through Monday into Tuesday and Wednesday of this week, you see there is moisture to work with with these storms across the north. But take a look at the tropical plume of moisture here as much dry air moves into the Great Lakes by Friday. But that drier in the Great Lakes is short-lived. Already into this weekend, we see a rebounding of a lot of tropical moisture making it clear up to Winnipeg. And as we just play this forward, look at this. This is next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And that is, that's a deep draw on tropical moisture in a huge section of the country. So I, I know I showed you that we got this drier look in an area, but I think it's still going to be able to get storms in that region. There's too much juice in the atmosphere to prevent it. So here we go. This is the AIFS forecast system. Now, can you see it? The first part of that time period, the flow is here. The second time it starts to build in to the midsection of the country. So this is the artificial intelligence forecast for the next seven days. Here is the NBM. There are possibly parts of Florida that pick up 10 inches of rain out of this. This is the WPC. A lot of upper Midwest, northern plain storms, Canadian prairie storms. I'm heading up here for a week. I'll be able to talk to several groups. And uh, I've got moisture for them when I come up there, so hopefully they'll be happy with me. But a chance to uh, dry down in some areas here after what has been a very wet couple of months. And we're going to watch heat build in as well. This is the 168-hour forecast from the ECMWF. That's seven days. And here is the GFS. Better agreement overall. If we look out there at the probabilities, this is the best chance at staying under a half inch. All right, so you're looking at your drier areas here. If we flip this over to an inch, this is where I have the highest chances of getting over an inch in the next seven days. And if we play that out a bit further, when that moisture returns, see it? As we work our way here into the solstice, that moisture is coming back, and that's why we start to see the more stormy corridor really beginning to open up. 
I do want to point out, thanks again to Ryan Maui for making this, that the ECMWF versus the GFS this past weekend, both of them really fell off in their skill scores. But interestingly enough, they both kind of fell off to the same spot, which is why they look very similar in their forecast. GFS left, European right. As we play it through Tuesday into Wednesday of this week, we see very similar things to what we saw in the um, high res NAM. There's that flow of moisture coming across Florida in both models. So here we are on Thursday getting into Friday. There's a front. It's in both models, exact same timing. I really like this. See the front here. This is Thursday night. It's in both models. We then get out there to Friday through Saturday. Again, they both have the same kind of little pulse of moisture coming through here. Really well timed. And even into next Saturday, Sunday, if you just take a look, both of them are doing this. Surge of tropical moisture coming in here to start that new week. And there's a disturbance somewhere in the Canadian prairie as the jet stream moves back toward that region. Now, the models are a little different in their placement, but at a week to see good agreement on the overall pattern, I'm pretty impressed with. So that surge of moisture coming in next week, that is going to be the thing we're going to have to watch open up to see if we can break down that stormier, excuse me, into a stormier corridor away from what the models have projected a bit drier. Okay, so here is week two only. Can you see it now? That is where we begin to open that up with our more northerly storm track. The CPC picked up on it. The GFS has it as well. This is where we kind of go back to that stormier and possibly hotter pattern. So let's talk about the temperatures here as we start to work our way toward the end of this. Here is our um, frost potential for the next seven days. Again, over the weekend, we saw better forecast evidence of the patchy frost this morning here. But as we work our way into today's highs, another hot one in the west. But watch the cooler air come into the northwest by Tuesday into Wednesday. And that'll start to break down some of this heat that is in the west. Meanwhile, it opens up in the central plains well into the 90s possible triple digits here colorado uh getting into uh you know kansas stretching all the way down you know to southern texas we're cooler in florida only because of cloud cover and rain this is friday saturday sunday this will be a hot week temperatures here easily getting up well into the 90s and some of this crop really needs this heat in this area packing some heat use that soil moisture get this thing to grow but as we saw in the forecast Day 5 through 10, look at the cooler weather coming back here in the northwest. Day 10 through 15, watch the warmth begin to build in this area as we work our way out there you know, toward the end of the month. That is when the larger ridge begins to really show up in the south and southeast. And the European model sees the same thing. This is day 5 through 10, and this is day 10 through 15. That to me shows kind of a full-scale retreat pretty far to the north of where the jet stream is going to be. And what that will eventually do is we'll have to watch daily to see where there is moisture being advected to know where it's going to rain and where there's going to be storms. We're about to make a full transition into summer for the country. I mean, just like a summer pattern. Some of you have already been hot. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the summer pattern, the northward retreat of the jet stream. And that's why we got to talk about this. This is the time series from the European model going out all the way through almost the end of July. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at the forecast of the Pacific North American pattern. Remember, when it's high, there's ridges in the west. And what I see in the model is a lot of that on average. So if we do not bring in a big western ridge and leave it in place across, the, especially the Pacific Northwest, all the way through the rest of June, you know, working our way in, into July. That is, uh, that's, if this model's got this right, this is significant. Because this, to me, tells me that the jet stream will stay pretty far to the north. And what we're going to be relying on then is much more subtle features to kick off precipitation events. And I'll start to get concerned about a southeastern United States ridge. So thinking about all of that, and this is the week three, week four update from um, the CPC. They put this out on Friday. And um, I can't disagree with it, especially on the temperature forecast. That northward retreat of the jet stream, I think that's got it. I think that's got what the temperatures are going to be like for a while. It's going to be the precipitation forecast that's going to be very, very complicated because it will all depend on where the ridge ends up building because there's going to be a ridge with that kind of heat. 
So let's take a look at the European model's version of this. See what came back? By the time we get toward the solstice, the models once again return large ridging here. And this is high pressure. This is surface high pressure. As we go forward, what I'm waiting for the models to indicate as we get into July is where the complementary high pressure cell to this one's going to be. Because a lot of times when you build a lot of high pressure here, we tend to get it somewhere between here or here or here. And you're going, Eric, you just covered, you know, half of the United. Yeah, I did. I, I don't know where it's going to end up showing up. But at this point, that's going to be the main pattern driver, I think, going into, you know, now through the beginning of July. And if I just take this all the way out there, let's go all the way out to mid-July, July 15, 16. How about there? And we look at what the precipitation is expected to do. This is the 30-day anomaly ending on July the 15th. Uh, 15th excuse me. And you remember at the beginning talking about Mexico? That was a while ago. Take a look at how much moisture is in the model coming from the Caribbean and the Gulf into Mexico. And we see the model showing up drier in this area. But I'll be honest with you, we've had the ability, despite the model forecast, to storm a lot in these areas. And we have to just establish where the ridge will be and how it, storms will eventually run over the top of it. I don't know where it's going to be just yet. I really don't. But that's what we've got. What I'm going to show you next is I want to go to the temperature pattern and do this in a seven-day sliding window. So here's now, the next seven days. This is getting out into week two. That's the warm-up we talked about. But with that full retreat north of the jet stream, the European model continues to anchor its heat right here in the central part of the United States. And that's what I'm going to have to watch carefully because that would be the first X here. And storms would run all around the periphery of this. They would form in it too, but they would mostly run around the periphery of this. You slide that over to the southeast, we have a whole different story. We're going to keep an eye on that. Uh, to compare this to some other data, this would be from the CFSV2 model. Let's look at the week three, week four precip. Again, it's got driest conditions in here with storms running around the edge. And if we look at the week four, this would be the first week of July. Uh, again, more stormy across the upper Midwest with drier maybe tucked in the middle. That's a tricky forecast. Uh, from there, let's look at the forecast for La Nina. The CFS V2 has backed off significantly from where it was but it's still the most aggressive forecast model with building a La Nina late this summer into fall. Most other forecast models are way up here around half degree cooler than average. The CFS V2 is a degree and a half cooler than average by October. And so I need you to keep that in mind because the CFS V2 is one of the major models that contributes to the NMME, the National Multimodel Ensemble. And as we note here, this is the new July, August, September forecast. Take a look at this. That could be the beginning of our very active hurricane season. And what's important here is that their forecast from May evolved into this for June. So this is the one that was initialized in May, looking at July, August, September. This is the newest one. And as I look at it, I didn't see much difference here. Where I saw differences in this. And the National Multimodel Ensemble went from a drier look to a much drier look in this area. Now this is a, got to be careful here. This is just a model forecast and it's not like it's calling for massive drought, but it just went drier in an area and I have to pay attention to that. Where that ridge sets up will ultimately dictate if this is how the pattern's going to look. But it's a reminder that this is just one model because the July, August, September forecast from the European model has a bullseye of wet right here where the new NMME just went with a bullseye of dry. See it? <laughs> a drier. So the models are not settled on exactly where this is going to be. They are in agreement about this and dryness throughout kind of the continental divide states. That is one thing that is consistent in these models. So throughout here in the plains of the Midwest, much more nuanced forecast going forward. My forecast continues to be for this area, hot and stormy this summer, hot and stormy. There will be flash drought because that's what you always get when it's a hot stormy pattern, localized flash drought. But I think we're gonna see a hot stormy corridor in through here. Okay, last thing I wanted to bring up to you today is just a quick international update, your next 10 days. Again, we're looking at more heat in throughout much of Western Russia, Eastern Europe, surrounding the Black Sea. Uh, take note of how hot it is in Southern Brazil as well. They should be going full into autumn here. Temperatures are 20 degrees above average. If we look at the precipitation patterns globally, 
I do want to note that the European model continued its trend to try to bring some storms into this area. Um, we'll have to just see if they manifest themselves. We're going back over wetter in southern Brazil after about, what was that, two weeks of drier conditions here. And take note of this very dry air that's in parts of India. We start to think about the end of June being the onset of the monsoon. Well, it's a bit late. What will be fun to watch is this frontal boundary right here. It's a monsoonal frontal boundary that stretches all along that arrow. And that particular spot is something where we have something called the Mayu front. It tends to just move farther and farther north as spring goes forward, delivering rains throughout the Yangtze River Valley. We've had a lot of flooding early this year in this area, but we're going to have to watch that as we go forward as well. Okay, that's what I have for you. I've been thinking about it all weekend. I'll give you another update tomorrow. I'll be in uh, Saskatoon when I do that update. So we'll talk soon. Thanks.